created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all Los Angeles County Sheriff's cars. Broadcast 156. Investigate the nude body of a man found in Latigo Canyon. No clues as to identity except one red necktie found on his neck. That's all. Rose and Quest. This broadcast marks the third anniversary of calling all cars. For three consecutive years, the solutions of actual crime cases have been thrillingly dramatized for the entertainment of millions of listeners. The Rio Grande Oil Company hopes you have enjoyed these programs and that you will continue to enjoy many more. If you have enjoyed them, it is primarily because they are true. Truth is not only stranger, but more convincing, more convincing than fiction. Calling all cars faithfully portrays the tempo of the modern war on crime. It is your sheriff, your chief of police, your district attorney, your fire chief who is dramatized here. Their courage, their devotion to duty, their efficiency is real. Calling all cars is not merely a play. It is a segment of life. It gives you a vivid picture of what is done in this modern world to make your daily goings and comings safe, to guard what you own and protect what you cherish. In these brilliant achievements, Rio Grande is happy to be playing a small but vital part. Rio Grande cracked gasoline is used in more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment wherever it is sold than any other brand. Los Angeles, Oakland, Berkeley, Fresno, Santa Barbara, San Diego, Maricopa, the largest county in Arizona, and many, many other cities and counties have specified Rio Grande cracked gasoline month after month. You can buy from your independent Rio Grande dealer exactly the same gasoline that these police cars use. If it is sufficiently outstanding to be chosen time after time for police cars, it should be the gasoline for you. And now, once again, we present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. Tonight, another milestone rolls by as calling all cars enters its third year of broadcasting. 156 weeks have gone by since the initial broadcast. 156 cases have been dramatized for the vast listening audience. Tonight, I should like to express my appreciation to you, as the audience, for having made calling all cars possible, and to my brother law enforcement agencies for their willing cooperation at all times. And now, I take pleasure in presenting Captain A.C. Jewell, Under Sheriff of Los Angeles County, Captain Jewell. Thank you, Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. There's an old saying, give, give a man enough rope and he'll hang himself. That is a theory that we of the Los Angeles Sheriff's Office works on. A man is innocent of a crime he has been accused of and is telling the truth when questioned. He should have no difficulty in giving the same answers every time. But a man is lying. He has to remember every tiny thing he has said, which usually proves to be too great a task for his mind. So we give a man ro enough rope or, in other words, get him to talk while we are making shorthand notes of his conversation. Then, we begin all over again. Ask the same questions in a little different order and check the original answers against the new one. And invariably, after repeating this process a few times, the truth is certain to come out. This is one of the many reasons why, once we get a guilty person and have a little chance to use this effective method of questioning on them, there's little chance of their ending up anywhere but where they belong, in the penitentiary. December 28, 1931. Over the Santa Monica Mountains, huge purple rain clouds move in from the ocean. Thunder mutters sullenly. Forked lightning stabs from the heavens intermittently, lighting the tangled, brush-filled ravine that is Latigo Canyon. Then rain, heavy, blinding rain that sends a great torrent of water roaring through the mountains to sweep trees, brush, massive boulders before it into the sea. On a small road leading out of Latigo Canyon, a Model T Ford sedan crawls to a shuddering halt. Two men climb out, sink up to their knees in the soft mud. We've got to hurry. This 
Storm's getting worse. Yeah, come on. Come on. Give me a hand with him. Okay. okay. I'll take his leg. Hey, you going to leave the tie on him? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Can't waste any time. Come on. All right. All right. We'll carry him over here by the clip. Come on. Hurry. Oh. Okay. Hey, this is all right. Now, over the edge. Shall I throw his clothes over, too? Oh, no, no. We'll get rid of him later somewhere up the road. Now, let's get out of here. We've got to hurry or we'll get caught here by the rain. For two days, the rain continues. For two days, the Santa Monica Mountains remain shrouded in a blanket of ominous black clouds. Then, as dawn breaks on the third day, the storm moves back to sea, leaving a stillness broken only by the monotonous dripping of water, the occasional scream of a gull wheeling high overhead. In the little sheriff substation of Malibu Canyon, deputies Chapman and Nestor are preparing to drive into Santa Monica Station when a car slides to a skidding stop in front. A man climbs out, hurries to the door. Looks like we got visitors, Ed. Yeah, in a hurry, too. <laughs> Are you the sheriff? Well, not exactly the whole sheriff, but I'm in charge here. Well, you'll do. There's a body up the road. A dead body. What? Yeah. And it hasn't any clothes on it. Now, wait a minute, mister. Take it easy. Well, I'm so... I'm so doggone out of breath that I... I can't talk very well. You say there's a body in the road? Yeah. Where? Up in Ladigo Canyon. It has, hasn't any clothes on it. So you said. Oh, I, I didn't find it. Brown did. One of the boys working on the road with me. But he, he said he didn't have any clothes. I think we better go out there and take a look, Joe. I, I can take you back to the camp in my car if you want to. The fellow that found it's waiting up there. No, we'll follow you in our car. Save you the trip back. Brown says it, it looks like murder. What made him say that? Because the body didn't have any clothes he, except a necktie around his neck. All right, you go ahead and we'll follow. And don't try to break any speed records on these roads. It's too slippery. No, sir. I, I won't. You, you just follow me. <laughs> So, with deputies Nestor and Chapman following in their car, the breathless road foreman drives to the camp. There they pick up Brown, the man who found the body, and drive on up the little road into Latigo Canyon. It's just up the road a ways, around that bend. Sure we can get all the way in the car? Yeah, the road's all right. You can make it. How'd you happen to find the body, Brown? Well, I was walking along, inspecting the roadbed to see what damage the rain had done. All of a sudden, I saw a silver pencil lying right in front of me. I picked it up and it seemed kind of queer that a pencil should be there, so I started looking around. Got the pencil with you? Yes, sir. Uh, right here. Good. Might be some use as identification. So anyway, when I was looking around, I noticed something white down on the side of the ravine, and... Uh, hey, hey, wait a minute. Here's the place right here. The body's down that little hill there. I'll show you. Right over here. Mm. Nice cheerful spot, isn't it? Yeah. There, see? You can see his legs sticking out of that crack there. It's a body, all right. Come on. Let's go down. Yeah. Take it easy, Red. Watch out for that brush there. Yeah. Look out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, huh. Naked as the day he was born. Yeah, except for one thing. That red tie around his neck. You gonna try to move him? No, I... I think we better leave him right where he is for the time being. The way that tie is pulled tight leads me to believe that maybe Mr. Brown's not so wrong about his murder idea. Well, we'd better go back and report this to the sheriff's office, Joe. Captain Bright will want to see it before it's moved. Come on. Notified by phone of the gruesome discovery, Captain Bright, in charge of the homicide detail, proceeds directly to the scene, examines the body. Nothing's been touched since he was found? No, sir. All right, boys, set up your camera and shoot this from all angles. Yes, sir. Come on, Al, give me your hand here. Any signs of identification on him? We didn't look for any, Captain. Thought uh, you'd want to do that. Good. Well, let's see. we got to figure a way of getting him out of here. It's going to be a job, sir. Probably have to use ropes. Yeah, it looks like it. You got those shots yet, boys? All set, Captain. Good enough. Rush them into town and get some prints made as soon as possible. Tell the boys in the office I'll be in as soon as I can. Yes, sir. Come on, now. Let's go. Now, all we have to do is figure out how to get a block and tackle rigged up here, and we can get started trying to identify the body. Both of which are liable to prove tough jobs. <laughs> And a tough job it proves to be. But at last, the corpse is raised to the road above and placed in an ambulance. Then, in a three-car procession headed by Captain Bright, the cavalcade drives to Los Angeles. 
After leaving the body still clothed in the red necktie of the county morgue, Captain Bright begins the tedious task of identifying it. In his possession are one silver pencil, one belt buckle bearing the initial E, and the red necktie, the only clues found at the scene. For two days, people file through the morgue, look at the dead man. But at the end of that time, there still is no lead as to who he was. And then, three days after the discovery of the body, another road worker, William Brandenberger, reports a bundle of clothes found two miles up Latigo Canyon. Acting upon this report, Deputy Sheriff Warner rushes to the spot, makes a quick examination. Hmm. Trousers, coat, vest, shoes, underwear, and hat. Complete wardrobe. Yeah, and here's something else I picked up while I was waiting for you. Looks like a spark plug wrench. Let me see. Yeah, that's what it is, all right. But from the looks of it, it wasn't used to remove a spark plug the last time. What do you mean? Uh, look at the end of it here. See these dark brown stains? Yeah. And notice how it's broken here. You know, unless I miss my guess, those stains were made by blood, human blood. You think someone was hit with it? That's right. And what's more, I think I have a pretty good idea who that someone was. You'd better come back to town with me if you can spare the time. I've got an idea. We can find the person these clothes fit. And Deputy Sheriff Barner proves to be right when the clothes are found to fit the mysterious corpse in the county morgue. A laundry mark found in the socks gives the officers their first real lead to work on, and losing no time, they set out on a tour of all the laundries in town, hoping to find the one that will have a mark coinciding with theirs. But after two days' intensive canvassing, no such place is found. Then, acting on a sudden hunch, Captain H.C. Brewster of the Santa Monica Sheriff's Office with Deputies F.P. Dickerson and O.H. Cloud turn from the laundries to local pickup stations. And the very first place they go in Sawtell, their luck changes. Well, sure, sure, I know them clothes. They're little Jack Irwins. I'd know them any time. You know where this Irwin lives? Sure, over at the soldier's home. He's a veteran. Anybody over there know them clothes, too. Everybody knows little Jack. Thanks a lot. Oh, I may want to ask you a few questions a little later. You here all the time? Sure thing. Anytime you want me, I'm right here. That's fine. Come on, boys. Let's take a ride over to the soldier's home. Yes. Those are Irwin's clothes, all right. What's the trouble? Jack in some kind of difficulties? I'm afraid so, Captain Gross. In fact, he's dead. Murdered. What? Little Jack Irwin murdered? Why... Well, that seems impossible. He was liked by everybody. Nevertheless, Captain, his body was found out in Latigo Canyon three days ago. Clothed in no more than a necktie. We found these clothes up the roadways. Well, who did it? That's one of the things we'd like to know. You couldn't make any suggestions, could you? Uh, no, I, I can't think of anyone who'd do it. Any particular spot where he might have spent a lot of time? You know, pool halls, spots like that. Well, there's Jack Shower's store down the road a ways. That's where some of the men spend a good deal of time. You know any of his particular pals here at the home? No, I don't think I do. You see, I don't get a chance to see much of the men, my duties and all that sort of thing. Of course, Captain. Oh, boys, we might as well look this Jack Shower's place over. There's a chance we might get a lead. Goodbye, Captain, and thanks. Well, let me know if you find anything out, will you? I'd certainly like to get my hands on whoever did this. Don't you worry. If we find the person, we'll take care of him, all right? Very good care. Come on, boys, let's go. By golly, that's too bad. Dirty shame. That's what it is. Why, that poor old devil wouldn't have a chance in a fight of any sort. He was weak. Well, tell me, it. Mr. Showers, uh, when was the last time you saw Irwin? Last time? Well, let me see. It was sometime around noon on the 28th, I think. Yeah, yeah, 28th. I remember because it was just a couple of days after Christmas. Was he with anyone at that time? Oh, sure. He always had a couple of people with him. Friendly sort of cuss, you know. Matter of fact, he went away with two young fellas last time I saw him. Did he have any money with him? Yes, yes. I remember changing a couple of tenors for him. He seemed to always have a lot of money on him. Had a great big diamond stick pin and a diamond ring, too. Now, tell me, Charles, was uh, Little Jack a drinker? I mean, a heavy one? <laughs> well, he... <laughs> He wasn't no teetotaler. Uh, that day, I remember he was pretty woozy. I had to ask the fellas with him to take him out before he got into trouble. You know who those fellows were? No, one of them. Named Hendricks. John Hendricks, I think it is. Good. We'll run that down right away. Know where he lives? Well, I heard him say something about a street in Pasadena. Big street, something like that. That's about all. And that's plenty. A cloud. Yes, sir. You better get on that right away. Go to Pasadena and find a John Hendricks on Lake Street. If you find him, bring him in with you. Okay. I'm going to stay around here and question a few more people. See you back in town. Right. So long. Thus, the first real progress on the bewildering enigma of Latigo Canyon. While Deputy Cloud speeds to Pasadena in search of the suspected John Hendricks, the rooster and Dickerson ask innumerable questions of inmates of the home. 
And as a result, they learned that a man named Hugh Thomas owned an old Cadillac car, the same kind and year as the one the spark plug wrench found in the canyon is from. With this information in hand, they lose no time in picking Thomas up and bringing him to Captain Bright's office for questioning. Sit down, Mr. Thomas. Yes, thank you. Now, uh, what's your full name? You, Samuel Thomas. What do you do for a living? Well, I'm an automobile mechanic by trade. I draw compensation from the soldier's home, though. That's what I live on. Have you ever been in jail, Thomas? Yes, sir. Once on a check charge here in L.A. I'm on probation right now. Any other times? A few times for vagrancy. At all? Yes, sir. Do you own a car? Yes. An old Cadillac? That's right. Mr. Thomas, have you ever seen this spark plug wrench before? Uh, why, uh, let me look. It's from the same make as your car. Yeah, I know that. Is that your wrench? Well, as a matter of fact, it is. I can tell from this little broken piece here. Uh, where'd you get it? Don't you know? No, sir. That's why I'm asking. It was picked up off the road about two miles from when we found the body of little Jack Irwin. Jack Irwin? Yeah. You know him? Sure. I knew him out at the home. Know anything about his death? No, sir. I, I didn't even know he was dead. He was murdered, Thomas. And we have a pretty good idea that it was this wrench that did the job. How do you figure that? You, you mean my wrench? That's right. Well, I don't know anything about it. Good gosh, you don't think I had something to do with it, do you? Well, it doesn't look any too good for you, does it? But I didn't have anything to do with it, honest. You're going to stick to that? Of course, it's, it's true. I'm afraid we'll have to hold you on suspicion of murder until we make a little more investigation, Thomas. But I, I didn't even know he was dead. This is the first time I've heard of it. I'm sorry, Thomas. You may be the most innocent man in the world. For the time being, until we explain this wrench, I'll have to hold you in custody. Oh. That's all. <laughs> Thomas is placed in jail, still denying any knowledge of the crime. And Captain Bright, Brewster, Deputies Cloud and Dickerson renew their investigation. Then, in Pasadena, Cloud locates the man who admits his name is Hendricks, but denies any knowledge of the crime. In Captain Bright's office, the men question him. Your name is John Hendricks? That's right. I understand you're quite a friend of little Jack Irwin out at the soldier's home. <laughs> Uh, you must have the wrong guy, then. I don't know any little Jack anybody. You don't know that little cripple fellow out there? Oh. There's a lot of cripples out there. That doesn't answer my question. I asked if you knew little Jack Irwin. And I told you no. Isn't that enough? No, not by a long ways. How about Jack Shower? You know him, don't you? Oh, sure. Hang around there much? Part of the time, yes. Were you in there the 28th of last month? Well, how should I know? I can't remember dates. You'd be a lot better off if you made an effort to remember that one. Well, well let me see. Uh, the 28th? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I was. That's better. Anyone else with you? Sam, that's all. Sam who? Sam Schwartz, the guy I know. Is little Jack with you? I told you about a dozen times I don't know any little Jack. You're getting pretty hot under the collar for no reason. Well, well, I don't like to be pinned down with a lot of questions. Why? Too hard to think of answers to them? No, no. It's just annoying, that's all. Was this Sam Schwartz drinking with anyone besides you? No, well, I, I guess he was. I, I don't remember. Did you see an old man with him? A fellow with one leg shorter than the other? I, I don't know. Did you know little Jack had been killed? I... I read about some guy being killed last week. Is that the guy you mean? Yeah. Little Jack Irwin. Well, all I know was what I read in the paper. How'd the paper say he was killed? Something about his being strangled with his tie. That's all you know about little Jack? Yes. Where can I find this Swartz man to talk to? I don't know. Sure? Well, you, you heard me. I said I don't know. All right, Hendricks. I'm not going to waste any more time with you. When you decide to remember a few things, send word to me. Until then, I've reserved a nice cell for you upstairs. Take him away. The second suspect is lodged in jail, and the investigation resumes. But an hour after Hendricks has been locked in his cell, a report comes in from Samuel Schwartz stating that John Hendricks had stolen his car. Faced with this new development, Schwartz is brought in for questioning. Well, that was very convenient of you, Mr. Schwartz. Calling in at that moment, I mean. What do you mean, convenient? Well, we were just going out to look for you. We didn't know quite where to begin. And then, suddenly, there you are. What's the idea looking for me? Your friend Hendricks mentioned you a few times, and we were questioning him. Thought you might be able to clear up a few things. Hendricks ain't my friend any longer. He stole my car. He used to be your friend. Is that right? Yeah, I guess so. Schwartz, I want to know where you were about noon on December the 28th. Well, I was a lot of places. Where, for instance? Oh, we drove around town, stopped over at Hendricks' sister's house for a while, and... What time did you go to Jack Shower's I... place? Did Hendricks say we were in Shower's place? It doesn't matter what Hendricks said. 
What do you say? Well, I don't know what time it was. We were there for a while. Were you with little Jack Irwin? No, I was with Hendricks. But you bought little Jack a couple of drinks, didn't you? No, sir. I don't remember that. Where does Hendricks' sister live, Schwartz? I don't see why I should tell you that. What's she got to do with all this? I don't know yet. I want to know where she lives. Well, she's got a little place over at 115 Bovo. 115 Bovo, huh? All right, Schwartz. I'm going to have to keep you here for a while till I talk to her. Maybe she can straighten things out for us. I don't see how she... Is that all you want to say? Yeah. All right, Brewster. Look, this man is suspicion of murder. Suspicion of murder? What are you trying to pull here? Nothing, Mr. Schwartz. Nothing at all. You just go along with Brewster here. I'll tell you all about it later. So, Sam Schwartz is put away in the county jail as number three suspect. And Deputy Dickerson is sent to the Beauville Street address where he interviews first the landlady, then Hendrick's sister. Now, Mrs. Clifton, I've just been talking to your landlady, Mrs. Doyle. She tells me that you've got something on your mind that you ought to tell me. Well, I, I don't know what to do. I, I feel that I should tell you, and yet it, it's an awful thing to have in my mind if I do. If you're hiding evidence of a crime, Mrs. Clifton, it'll weigh a lot heavier on your mind if you don't tell it. What can I do, Mrs. Doyle? What's the right thing to do? Sure, and you know how I feel about it, Nellie. You've got to get it over with. All right. I guess it's best. Hey, take this down, Lynch. Hey! My brother, John, came into my room the other night and woke me up. He was terribly excited and scared, and he sat on my bed and told me... Go on, Mrs. Clifton. He told you what? Well, it's, it's so hard to do this to my own brother. Well, of course it is, but it's the right thing to do. All right. He told me that he was afraid, and he asked me if I'd read about the murder of the old man in the papers. Yes? I told him I had, and then I looked at his eyes, and I knew what he was afraid of. I knew right then. And I asked him if he'd done it, and he said, he said, yes, he and Sam. Meeting Sam Swartz? Yes. And I asked him why he'd done it, and he said that he and Sam had been over at some place drinking with this man, and that the man got drunk, and... The proprietor asked him to take him out, and they did, out in their car, and they started riding around to sober him up. Then he, he got abusive and started trying to steer the car off the road and a lot of things, and John picked up a wrench from the floor and hit him. Not hard, but just to quiet him. Well, what happened then? Well, John said that they drove around some more, and then this man started getting mean again, so they stopped the car and they started to get out. It was a, a struggle or something, and John hit him again. Then this Sam grabbed his tie, and he pulled it tight until the man stopped moving. Sam did that part of it? Well, that's what John told me. Then he said they, they took his clothes off and drove down to some canyon and threw him out of the car. And later they threw the clothes out. Well, now, Mrs. Clifton, will you be willing to sign a statement of what you've just told me? Oh, yes. Yes, I will. Thank you. And if you'll witness it, Mrs. Doyle, I won't bother you anymore. This is all we need to complete our case. Well, what'll they do to John? Well, I can't say, ma'am. That'll be entirely up to the judge and the jury. I might hazard a guess, but it wouldn't mean anything, so I won't try. Well, goodbye. Thanks. Armed with a full confession from Hendrick's sister, the first suspect, Hugh Thomas, is released, and Captain Bright feels the evidence strong enough to bring the men to trial. Then, suddenly, in the midst of it, a sudden new development throws the courtroom into confusion. George Morgan, a prisoner in the county jail on charges of murder, calls Attorney Cooper and Deputy Sheriff Brewster to his cell and makes a startling statement. You guys are trying to hang the wrong guy for that Irwin job. What do you mean by that, Morgan? Just what I said. Those fellas didn't do it. I did. You did? Sure. Me and a friend was driving a car, and we ran over him. We were scared to report it, so we drove him out to a place and threw him out. You and who else? A guy I know. What's his name? His name? I don't remember. Oh, yeah, yeah, Keller, that's it. Who was driving the car? He was, Keller. He didn't see the guy until we hit him. Where were you when you hit him, Morgan? Out by the old soldier's home on the road there. And where was the place you threw the money? I don't know exactly. It was a typical mountain road down by the beach. You're on the same tank with John Hendricks, aren't you? Yeah. What's that got to do with it? How much did he pay you for this? Say, what are you talking about? I'm making a confession to save some innocent guys from hanging, that's all. You're pretty sudden to go up on the murder charge you're in for now, aren't you, Morgan? Yeah, I guess so. The one more murder wouldn't make much difference to you. I don't get it. All right, I'll put it in plainer words. You and Hendricks have been together in the same tank. 
Somewhere or other, Hendricks has talked you into taking the rap for him. Isn't that right? No, that's not right. It seems to me this is a pretty funny place when a guy can't even confess to a killing without being handed the third degree. But when Confessor Morgan is questioned closely as to the details of the crime, he becomes so confused that it is obvious he is lying. So Hendricks and Schwartz are tried in Judge Fletcher Boren's court on charges of murder and robbery. And at 11.30 on the morning of March 19th, three months after the brutal slaying in Latigo Canyon, the jury files in and the verdict to the court clerk. Will the clerk read the verdict, please? We the jury find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree and recommend life in prison. <laughs> John Hendricks were sentenced to San Quentin for life, with an added clause stating that no parole should be given. So, through the work of Captain Bright, Deputies Brewster, Dickerson, and Cloud, the brutal slaying of little Jack Irwin was solved, and the perpetrators placed in the penitentiary for as long as they shall live. In our three years' association with law enforcement agencies, we have developed profound respect for the efficiency of the men on the firing line who guard your life and property against fire, accident, and crime. They take no chances of failure in the trust the public imposes. Every man must be alert and ready for action. Every car roadworthy and ready to go. We feel it is no ordinary testimonial when these masters of efficiency themselves show their respect for our products by using Rio Grande cracked gasoline in more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment wherever it is sold than any other brand. You will find Rio Grande cracked gasoline just as capable of police car performance in your car. And Sinclair motor oil is just as dependable. Sinclair Pennsylvania and Sinclair Opaline are both thoroughly de-waxed, de-jellied motor oils in refinery-sealed, tamper-proof cans. If you want to do something that will delight the heart of some boy or girl, get a free copy of Calling All Cars News from any independent Rio Grande service station and learn how you can secure junior detective and G-man outfits for them absolutely free. Police badges, fingerprint outfits, sirens, more than a dozen gifts, all free. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all Los Angeles County Sheriff's cars. A cancellation broadcast 156 regarding a body found in Latigo Canyon. This case has now been solved. And that's all for old and questions.